Metro Exodus is filled with intimate moments. From smoking while you chat with a friend, to entertaining with your guitar skills. To pouring a drink for your wife. Metro Exodus is full of meaningful interpersonal actions. The overall flow of the game is a series of large, open-world locations punctuated by train rides between them. The train is everybody's home while they look for somewhere free of radiation to live long-term. Living in a train means everybody's intimately familiar with everyone else's life. Almost everywhere is a shared space. These train rides are where most of the intimate moments take place. When you're at a destination is when most of the shooting happens. In those places, there's little room for anything but violence. But in the between places, aboard the train, shoulder to shoulder with your family and friends, there's time for sitting with your friends and drinking to celebrate. There's time for a caring touch. Sometimes these moments are in cutscenes where you have no control, but most of the time you do have some control. All the little interactions you can do during what would otherwise be a cutscene made me feel part of what was happening, rather than my eyes glazing over as I passively watch. One of my favorite interactions is where you can smoke and chat at the same time. It gives you the choice of when you want to take a drag from your cigarette. I found myself role-playing those moments. I kept making sure to turn my face away from the character I was talking to when I exhaled so the smoke didn't go in their face. I made sure to await a good amount of time between drags, too. And when I was smoking in a tense situation, I chain-smoked to distract from the stress. In those moments, I was role-playing as the character and present in the moment. Metro Exodus is also filled with deliberate inconvenience. Your equipment is a bunch of taped-together spare parts, and the environments you go through are harsh. Stuff falls apart, needs cleaning, charging, and repairing all the time. Weapons get dirty the more they're used. Dirtiness is more than just a visual thing. It reduces accuracy, damage, and makes it more likely to jam. Cleaning it takes up chemicals, one of the two crafting ingredients. And cleaning takes time. You hold down a button and watch the weapon get cleaner and cleaner until it's sparkly clean. It's a simplified version of the reality these characters are in. Equipment needs to be maintained, and that takes time and resources. The gas mask is another inconvenience. Some areas have toxic air and require you to wear it. The mask has its own condition, too. If you wear the mask while fighting, it can get cracked. That makes it harder to see and can leave a hole in the mask that needs to be patched in the field as a temporary fix. Once you're back at a workbench, it can be properly fixed. Your mask also needs the air filters switched out periodically. Also, if you get gunk on the faceplate, you need to wipe it off. Your flashlight and night vision goggles also require power, which is supplied by a hand-operated charger. It becomes a routine thing to pull a charger out every few minutes and squeeze the handle a bunch of times, then switch back to whatever I had in my hands before. There are two weapons that also need to be charged with their own unique charging systems totally separate from the normal hand charger. It's yet another thing to manage. Large spider webs that hang from the ceiling will slow you down as you walk through them. To get rid of them, you have to take out your lighter to burn them away, which means another thing to switch back and forth from. The map, which is a physical thing that you have to pull out and look down at, has a little light on it, this is great in many situations, but if you have night vision on, the map is completely blown out. It adds another thing to manage. If I wanted to see where I was, I had to turn night vision off, take out the map, look at it, then put away the map and turn night vision back on. Any one of these inconveniences wouldn't be a big deal, but all together they make for a constant routine of switching between things and managing your equipment. 
Let's go into a hypothetical of how cumbersome it can be to manage all these things by looking at all the buttons that I would have to press to make them happen. I'm using mouse and keyboard for the controls, by the way. I'm inside a dark building. I press N to start using the night vision goggles. A low battery indicator appears. I hold down F to bring up the hand charger and mash left mouse to charge it. Then I hold F again to put it away. I come upon some webs. I press L to bring out my lighter so I can burn the webs. But the lighter blows out my night vision goggles, so I press N to turn off night vision and then press F to turn on the flashlight. I burn some webs, then come across a spider. I shoot it, then press R to reload. Reloading takes two hands, so it puts away the lighter. After reloading, I press L again to bring the lighter back out. I start coughing, indicating toxic air, so I hold down G to put on the gas mask. I switch to the T-car, a pneumatic weapon that shoots steel balls and needs to be recharged by pumping it up. I get attacked by another spider, and it breaks my mask. I kill the spider and press G to apply a patch to the face screen. I then hold down R to allow me to pump up the T-car and mash left mouse to charge it up. Then I hold R to put the weapon back down. I notice my flashlight is growing dull, so I hold down F to bring out the hand charger and mash left mouse to charge it. Then hold F to put the charger back down. I realize that I'm running out of steel balls for my T-car, so I hold I to bring out my backpack for crafting. I craft some steel balls and press right-click to exit the crafting menu. I hear a beeping warning me that my air filter is running out, so I press T to change the filter. You probably get the picture. There's a lot of awkward and frequent button presses to do in addition to things like movement and aiming. I played the game for 41 hours, and even by the end, I still fumbled with the controls occasionally. All these awkward things were inconvenient, but it made me feel some of the weight of needing to manage all this equipment in such a hostile environment. It became a background hum to everything, always topping up my charger and making sure everything was in its proper place. It requires a lot of attention to keep everything maintained while trying to move and shoot at the same time, and I love that. All the time-consuming fiddling around with knobs and buttons. All gorgeous hand animations. Metro Exodus loves hands and tactility, buttons and knobs, fiddly bits and bobs. Every piece of equipment, whether weapons or radio, are lavishly detailed with things to press or touch or hold. Something as simple as searching for a signal on a radio is accompanied by your hand turning a knob to change the radio frequency. Turning on the light at your desk means reaching over to the lamp and flicking it on. I was expecting Metro Exodus to focus almost entirely on first-person shootery things, with any other interactions relegated to the occasional cutscene. I was surprised and happy to see that they gave me big blocks of downtime to do anything but shoot. The game didn't feel scared of boring me with these long, intimate sections. It let them breathe. It let me roleplay and touch people and be in the moment. It felt unapologetically inconvenient, too. It's a deliberately clunky, awkward thing to play. One where I got dirty and my guns jammed and I had to juggle three things while trying to dodge gunfire. And because of that, I never felt like I was just along for the ride. I was always present. I finished Metro Exodus feeling like I had just been on the adventure of a lifetime traveling thousands of kilometers and fending off monsters and cannibals to find a place to live with my weird little train family.